it's good to see uh, a lot of familiar faces, a lot of new faces. Uh, and I'm very happy that you were able to spend your afternoon here to discuss the uh, ever more important question of self-regulation on the internet. Um, my name is Marietje Schaak. I'm a member of the European Parliament for the Alliance of Liberals and Democrats for Europe from the Netherlands with D66 political party. And uh, I deal with uh, issues relating to Europe's digital agenda, um, especially uh, intellectual property rights issues, net neutrality, uh, but also with international trade and foreign affairs. But we're not necessarily talking about that today, although the standards that we set ourselves do have a significant impact on our credibility in the world. Um, we're going to have an afternoon with two panels. One uh, will give the sort of institutional view, uh, where we're very happy to have two guests from uh, the European Commission. Werner Steng will speak with us uh, first, will introduce his ideas. He is the head of unit of online services of DG Markt. And Nicole de Vandre is uh, with DG Info Society, Information Society and Media where she is a counselor of stakeholders issues. So uh, I think the two uh, are very well positioned to give different perspectives from the European Commission side, and then we'll have a discussion um, on what they've introduced. And then at around four, but we're a little bit late, let's say 4.15, uh, we'll have a new panel, which I'll introduce then. And the reason why um, I wanted to invite you all to take part in this discussion is that there's a number of subjects where the question of who gets to make the final decisions uh, on what happens on the internet becomes relevant. Um, it's relevant when it comes to uh, illegal content, uh, whether it is uh, the discussion about child pornography or uh, violence or terrorism related issues, all the way to uh, what could be hate speech uh, and uh, recently um, highlighted also by the European Court of Justice uh, verdict uh, how to deal with intellectual property rights uh, infringement, so-called piracy discussions, uh, and what is, what is an effective way to deal with it. Uh, there's a big push, I would say, for uh, multi-stakeholder initiatives in a number of angles of, of internet governance, uh, including when it comes to dealing with uh, illegal or inappropriate content. And for us, as members of European Parliament, people who seek to uh, deal with lawmaking and policy making, uh, and as democratically elected officials, the question is, of course, who has the ultimate responsibility? And how do we preserve a separation of powers in a democratic society? Uh, where does democratic oversight come in? Uh, and how do we ensure that people's fundamental rights uh, are preserved. And so in that sort of context, um, I look forward to the discussion this afternoon. Uh, so I would now like to give the floor to Werner. And I also encourage you all to uh, be active in the discussion. So save your questions and there will be plenty of time for that. Werner, please go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chan. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I think you are manipulating the slides, Ben, so if we could just have the first slide, please. Oh, it's up there. Sorry. I, I thought I would see it in front of me, which I don't. Uh, all right. So I'm Werner Stenk, Head of Unit for Postal and Online Services in DG Markt. Uh, I'm very grateful uh, for um, Madame Schake to have organized this event because uh, the topic is extremely important also for us. And uh, as you all know, lots of things are going on in this area a lot of national activities, a lot of court rulings all over the place. So uh, I'm, I'm grateful for any opportunity to, to obtain more feedback and, and views on, on this important topic. Now, while the, the, the heading or, or the, the title of this conference is self-regulation, uh, as you can expect from a good commission official, I will more focus on regulation, namely that part of regulation that I'm in charge of and that has something to say on this issue, which is the e-commerce directive um, so what I'm going to do in my short presentation is, first of all, to repeat a bit what the e-commerce communication has to say on this. Secondly, uh, assess to what extent it works, uh, given its policy objectives. And thirdly, what we intend to do on, on this subject matter in the months to come. Um, next slide, please. Yeah. So first of all, the e-commerce directive, as most of you certainly know, uh, contains several articles on the so-called liability regime. 
uh, the objective is, is at least twofold. I mean, there are con sometimes conflicting interests to be reconciled. We clearly want uh, the internal market for information society services uh, to work, and the whole e-commerce directive is meant to facilitate that. Uh, but equally important, uh, there are also lots of, of other interests and fundamental rights and different fundamental rights that are affected as well. The e-commerce directive, as well as the liability regime uh, contained in it, is horizontal in, in nature and scope. So it uh, does not is not restricted to a specific type of illegal content. So, but whatever uh, the reason may be for this illegality, uh, the regime applies. So in that sense, it covers anything from IPR infringements down to child abuse, terrorism, hatred, and so on and so forth. Uh, it covers um, different scenarios and different types of services, mere conduit, caching, hosting. The most important articles are clearly the ones that I put on my slide, Article 14 and 15. Um, most of you, again, will know that. Article 14 clearly spells out that uh, the hosting intermediary is not uh, liable for illegal content um, if, it's not, if it doesn't have actual knowledge. Uh, of such content, but once he obtains such knowledge, uh, he has to act expeditiously to remove or to disable access to it. Um, that's the correct language. That is, by the way, also why on my first slide you may have noticed I was having notice and action rather than what is commonly referred to as notice and takedown, uh, because there are, there's not only takedown that is foreseen here, but also uh, the blocking, disabling access to it. So that is all pretty clear uh, as, a, as a general principle, but not when it comes to interpreting it and applying it on the ground, as we will see in a minute. Article 15, uh, at least equally important, uh, says that member states may not impose on online intermediaries a general obligation to monitor the content they transmit or host. Once again, very good principle, uh, and also once again, um, has been interpreted quite differently by, by many players. Um, some, some other stuff, obviously, in that directive that is relevant. To give just two examples, first of all, there's also a, cl a clear acknowledgement in the directive, in its recital 46, that uh, whenever such action is taken, removal or disabling of access, the principle of the freedom of expression has to be uh, observed. Uh, and also, and that's at least uh, some, some link to the self-regulation theme here, there is also an encouragement in, in that directive, in its Article 16, that codes of conduct, uh, conduct should be, uh, should be uh, drawn up. Uh, not much has happened here, I'm afraid, but anyway, there, there is this link in the directive as well. Now, that's where the directive more or less stops in terms of guidance and rules. Um, and as you all know, uh, there has been many different interpretations across member states. There have been different court rulings at national level, at, but also at EC, EZJ level. Uh, and we have had some recent case law here. Um, and I've just put up some examples here on, on what that case law said in very simplified language. The first issue here is, um, when and how do you obtain actual knowledge according to the court? Um, and there are different, uh, there's different guidance then, that came out of those court rulings. Already I have to say that none of these rulings has exhaustively interpreted these articles. Yeah? So we still don't have uh, clear-cut clear clear -cut rules on all the terms and, and concepts uh, introduced by our directive, but there is at least some indication. So you could obtain knowledge uh, if your role is not, and that's from the Google LVMH case, not merely technical, automatic, or passive. Um, in the case of Google, that referred, for instance, to the drafting of, of the commercial message which accompanied the advertisement link, or it was the establishment or selection of keywords. So there's some additional information on what, in that particular case, active role meant. There's also something, obviously, in the L'Oréal eBay, eBay case, where they said 
uh, that eBay was active to the extent that it optimized the presentations of the offers for sale or promoted these offers. So, but this is just case by case interpretation that gives some ideas, but obviously not, it, it does not give the final answer. Secondly, um, you can also obtain actual knowledge by means of an own initiative or by means of notification. Uh, own initiative um, obviously means that if the intermediaries um, do something on their website and find such content, then it has obtained actual knowledge. That's fairly obvious. The notification is also clear. The only additional guidance here was that it has such notification has to be sufficiently precise and substantiated. Again, you could then take each of those words and, 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 and try to put more, more meaning on this. As regards injunctions um, and Article 15, um, it clearly said in the L'Oréal eBay case um, that uh, a court may oblige an intermediary to take measures that puts an end to IPR infringements. It was an IPR case, uh, but also to prevent further infringements. And the second quote here from the very, very recent Scarlett Sabam ruling said um, that a court may not oblige an intermediary to install a general filter to avoid certain IPR infringements. So that was very much in line with the, the, the whole purpose of Article 15. Uh, but again, we're in this discussion now of what is general, what is specific, how specific does it have to be, and so on and so forth. But in any event, these were some important uh, cases that will help us in further debates. Now, when we did a public consultation on our on the e-commerce directive, but on, on e-commerce more largely speaking last year, um, we got lots of replies to this consultation. We had some 420 replies, 5,000 pages of text. And as part of the part of the questions obviously related to this liability regime, and there was a lot of feedback on that. Um, generally speaking, for the whole directive, as well as for the liability regime, most people felt that we should not change these rules. That the e-commerce directive, generally speaking, had been very, very useful in the development of, of online services and e-commerce in Europe, has been an enabling factor. Um, and also the liability regime, uh, the principles have proven their, their or have kept their value but, but there may be need for clarification because, as indicated before, there's been a lot of divergent use and, 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 and rulings on, on, on these provisions. Most specifically, the criticism was that um, where indeed content was illegal and should have taken down, should have been taken down, such takedown had been too slow or had not taken place. The second group of complaints was that uh, rules are so fragmented across Europe that this has re reduced legal certainty for economic actors or for anybody involved in this, uh, has therefore also increased compliance cost for internet service providers and so on. And the third group of concern was in the area of civil rights in that uh, the directive uh, or at least interpretation that has been uh, given um, has created some incentive to take down content, even if such content is legal, that sometimes an ISP, in order to avoid trouble, if in doubt, takes down the content. Um, second, that there are no or not sufficient or not sufficiently fair appeals procedures for those whose content has been taken down. And generally speaking, a, a lack of transparency of how all of this is, is done and operated and the who does what and, and so on and so forth. Now, um, based on this large consultation and a lot of other things we've been doing, uh, we have prepared a communication on e-commerce and online services that is um, currently being translated and will be adopted, hopefully, uh, by the European Commission on the 11th of January next year. Um, 
that's a, that's a broader issue, obviously, than liability. So we're looking into many different things that are relevant to e-commerce. But one of the issues is the, the liability regime, um, where in the, in the staff working paper that is attached to the communication as a detailed description of the status quo, so what we have found, what's going on out there, what has been brought to our attention. And then we announce uh, an initiative on uh, notice and action um, based on the directive. Um, so, because one of the main conclusions of our communication is, by the way, that the e-commerce directive will not be changed. So that also means that all the articles linked to the liability regime uh, will stay there as well as they are, but uh, that we will look into the procedures that are needed to implement those principles. So we will examine how these, these procedures, procedures are carried out in the real world um, and to see whether there is any good practice uh, that can be taken as a general guidance on how such a process could be carried out that would respect all, all the principle uh, values that, that, you may, that you may expect here. And definitely, uh, I'm not just talking about the economic rational here and interests, but very much all the fundamental rights and freedoms that are concerned by this. So that is ongoing work. Um, we have uh, no uh, idea yet on what the outcome will be, which is good. We have not uh, any, we don't have any political guidance or instructions that would push us in one direction or the other. We can really sit down, discuss, examine, uh, and then see whether and what can be so whether something can be done and what can be done in order to bring more more clarity and certainty into this highly highly sensitive uh, area. So that's where we are. Um, we are last bullet point here, uh, at the stage of collecting input uh, from everybody who has something to say on this, which is once again why I'm very, very grateful for having been invited here and to have a chance to listen to all of you here and hopefully provide some answers as well. Thank you very much. Thanks for your introduction. Um, we're going to go straight on with this. Devon. Thank you. Uh, and, and uh, yes, thank you very much for this opportunity to share with you uh, the views of, of Nelly Cruz and the Director General Information Society and Media on self-governance uh, in the domain of the Internet. I want to, yes, I can just uh, first anchor the, the few remarks in, in, in noting that the self-regulation comes from the 2001 White Paper on European Governance, where the... Um, where we notice that the representation mode of, of policy making and law um, didn't manage to take into account new trends, uh, globalization, the problem of sanitary things, a lot of issues where other stakeholders needed to be involved. This not meaning that the system was not good, but just that we had to, in a resilient mode, so to speak, see how in the policy making we involve other actors in, a, in an inclusive way. So, so I think that um, this is really where the self and co-regulation processes come from and should be looked at in that global perspective of a completion, and, and I will um, explain that a little bit more. The last event, uh, the last document that the Commission adopted uh, on corporate social responsibility to, to give a new momentum to the corporate social responsibility policy. Um, a communication was adopted in October. This is the last bullet on the slide there. And in that communication, there are two actions particularly on which I want to draw your attention. Uh, the one is the next slide, please. <laughs> Sorry. Um, the first action in that communication on corporate social responsibility, it says that the Commission intends to create multi-stakeholder CSR platforms in a number of relevant industrial sectors for enterprise, their workers, other stakeholders to make public commitments on the CSR issues relevant to each sector and jointly monitor progress. 
I want to inform you that um, we want DG Info, uh, uh, want internet to be one of these sector, uh, one of these relevant industrial sector, so that uh, we will uh, create uh, one multi-stakeholder platform in, in this area. The next slide shows you the second action where AFSO will play a particular role. And this is a linkage between self and co-regulation processes and corporate social responsibility. Because in this commission, we state, in this communication, sorry, we state that it is part of what is expected from corporations for demonstrating a corporate social responsible behavior to engage in self and co-regulation processes with a certain ethics and, re and re respecting basic principles. So we would like to launch a process, we will launch a process in 2012 with enterprise and other stakeholders to develop a code of good practice for self and co-regulation exercise. So this to really set standards, uh, basic expectation, design principles to make sure that self and co-regulation processes when they take place are not an easy way out um, of, of making uh, uh, engagement behind closed doors and with no accountability. We want this process when they happen and when they, that they are really uh, up to standard. So the next slide will show you what we expect uh, as good practice, but of course this needs to be validated by the process that is announced in the communication. We think that good practice in self and co-regulation is when the stakeholders, uh, the process is open from the start. That is, that all stakeholders and not only the corporation that will take the commitment are around the table. That the process is transparent, that where there is a possibility, notably by virtual debate and ICT based tool to engage in the process. Uh, the sincerity means uh, that we have to agree on the common goals and not play around if possible and really be frank and agree uh, with all stakeholders on the concept and the goal of the measures and the codes of conduct that will be approved. A monitoring will need to be put in place uh, by independent bodies so that civil the society can rely on this monitoring. Of course, compliance should be seeked, and if repeat offense, uh, sanctions should be foreseen. So that with this kind of good practice, we think that self and co-regulation are really, next slide, uh, we are there, yeah, are um, to be seen as complementary to the other forms of policy making, and in particular, law, um, law, law making, because the so complementarity plays at different levels. Uh, first, that there is law act, the, the possibility to, to take regulatory action if the self and co-regulation processes do not deliver is always there, the sort of back stick argument. Of course, self and co-regulation, as mentioned in the interinstitutional inter agreements, has to be not only compliant with existing le legislation, but also should not substitute to area where it's better to act by law than by self and co-regulation. So that complementarity is really a key feature uh, of self and co-regulation when they take place. The second thing is I think that self and co-regulation processes allow to really take into account the increased complexity. Each of us has a, a different way to define what complexity means, but I, I think we can, we can admit that basically it means that any any command and control model is, as soon as it is set, it is already um, dépassé or um, out. Uh, how should I say? I'm sorry. That as soon as you set something in place, the feedback effects are so quick that uh, it, it's very difficult to know, um, to, to, to have the expected impact only happen and that you have a lot more things, feedback effect uh, coming in. So that. In fact, the law, the, we, we have seen with the case law the importance of case law for also understanding of the rule and what it means to, to respect the rule. And I think that in the same way, we must also uh, take advantage of the, the capital of, of reputation uh, for the corporation and the public opinion and that there can also be a pressure through these modes of uh, if, we, if we manage to get through self-regulation good behavior, as, as we all expect, in a transparent way, um, this is another, an additional way to uh, sort of uh, act on, on the system through indeed reputation and, um, and, and public opinion. 
So, so this uh, complexity, this is what I mean by expansion of public sphere and debate, is not to rely that only the parliamentarians will do the, judge, the, the job and then the judge and that the company will pay a fine if they don't comply. No, I think indeed we all have a civil society um, to, to, to stay on the ball all the time and express, also exert the pressure of the public opinion and the public debate beyond these more formal uh, judiciary uh, channels. So, uh, then, uh, of course, internet and the digital transition at large uh, really are a, a, an area, a, a playing ground where self and co-regulation have a, a great role because the complexity, it, it impacts society in a such complex way and in such profound ways that I think we are in one of these areas where really nobody can predict exactly what is the exact impact of one measure and we all have to be resilient and adaptive. We are really in a transition management mode. So next, please. This being said, I want to <coughs> restate here uh, internet essentials. Uh, as Nelly Cruz has called them in a speech that she did uh, at the high level meeting on the internet economy at the OECD uh, in June last, uh, before the summer, where she has put forward six essentials. Uh, the first one is let's keep one internet, and, and here I want to quote, so she, she said, internet's most important characteristics is its universality. The second essential is that we are people and not atoms nor packets to be switched. So internet is really not just a pla technological platform, but a forum where people interact. And with that, I want to say that she's fully aware of the importance of internet on people's life. And we all, of course, uh, keep this in mind all the time. The third essential is architecture, architecture matters. And she says that the current architecture of the internet is fundamental to its dynamic, socially, politically, legally, and economically. So that is really full recognition and support to the generative nature of internet. She also said that we need to have a broad, structured, and coherent debate with internet policy and research communities on the impact of any change in architecture. The fourth essential she puts forward is that barriers to trust are barriers to access. So indeed, reliability, confidence, uh, has to be um, strong on the internet. The fifth one is to make internet a pro-democracy tool. And with that, also acknowledging that we need to support bottom-up approach to problem solving so that citizens can co-create solutions. The sixth essential is let's make the internet a multi-stakeholder and transparent uh, tool where uh, recognizing also that uh, institutions of democracies have duties towards citizens to, to maintain internet as such. So this is, these are strong engagements and sharing of vision of what is essential to the nature of internet uh, for our commissioner. So in the self-governance area, there are two places now. Yes, the next one. In small letters is, is a speech reference uh, that you can find. So on the do not track um, strategy, she has called um, in, in a speech in, in June um, in Brussels, she has called for do not track standards uh, to, be, um, to be adopted by the internet industry and the behavior, online behavioral um, advertising industry. And she expects results by uh, June 2012. Another area where we are practicing self-regulation for the moment is Better Internet for Kids, where last week uh, a coalition of 28 major companies in the internet, this is, yes, the next one, has adopted to engage in an exercise with five goals to make progress, to make simple and robust reporting tools, to make wider use of uh, age, to, to have age-appropriate default privacy settings, to make a wider use of content classification, wider availability and use of parental control, and effective takedown of child abuse material. Now, upcoming, uh, this Friday, uh, at the conference Freedom Online, that takes place in The Hague uh, tomorrow and Friday, where Hillary Clinton, I think, speaks tomorrow, um, 
so Nelly Cruz will uh, make an, uh, an address. And also on Monday, uh, there is a joint announcement to be made by her with um, Vice President High Representative Ashton uh, on, on this Monday. So I just encourage you to pay attention to, to these two events where she uh, will speak. So with this, I, in conclusion, I really want to say again that we have a twin engagement. First, to, uh, for a, a universal and generative vision of the internet. And second, for an inclusive policy making, to really engage uh, into an inclusive policy making away from seeing self-regulation uh, as an opposition or to uh, another mode of lawmaking that would be uh, wrong or broken. Not at all. We really want to take the most, the best out of these two ways of, um, of making policy in the sense that society expects and deliver societal goods. And with that, I will also, as my colleague mentioned, that I'm very thankful you organize this because I part of, we, we are here to listen uh, now that we have taken, said what we have to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I can already feel uh, a lot of questions coming up, and I'm going to actually make use of the benefit of chairing this meeting by asking two questions myself to begin with. Uh, what fascinates me, uh, first, for Mr. Steng, a question. Uh, when you mentioned that a company is not liable when it doesn't know uh, what content might be uh, on its platform or whatever, which could be illegal. Uh, and that leads me to the question of where is actually the um, source or the stimulus for uh, addressing issues in the context of self-regulation or co-regulation, it sounds even friendlier. Um, because we know that there's a real interest from certain industries, for example, uh, and there's a disproportion, disproportionate power sometimes. So some industries might have a real uh, interest in, in taking certain content down. They may have uh, lawyer teams who are doing nothing but reporting content. Uh, and thereby, perhaps, this, this window of, of not knowing what content is, it is about is, is very, very small, uh, but also the direction or the uh, responsibility put in the hands of certain players can be uh, quite disproportionate. So I'm curious about that. Um, actually, we're looking here in Europe at some uh, impacts that could be foreseen when we're also looking at the United States, where two bills, uh, when it comes to self-regulation um, in light of intellectual property rights, are under debate. One is called the Stop Online Piracy Act. The other is called Protect Intellectual Property Rights Act, which could even go as far as uh, having websites taken down that are uh, hosted elsewhere in the world. So basically, uh, how far uh, can this go? Uh, and my general question, I guess, for uh, both of you, but I'll direct it especially at Ms. De Wandere, because she mentioned those um, principles of an open internet, which I think are very important. The notion of one internet, uh, which clearly this extraterritorial impact would, would break. Uh, so how to prevent that? And also how to make sure um, that law enforcement, which is traditionally uh, in the hands of, of government, uh, isn't outsourced, isn't privatized um, to an extent that it has a serious impact on internet users. So thank you. And then I'll start looking around for questions. Yeah, it's, a, it's a difficult question, obviously. Um, <clears throat> the directive, as, as I presented it or reiterated it to those who know it already, um, is deliberately uh, limit itself to establishing some general principles and sort of things that we want. And then we have to see how we can best uh, obtain those results. I mean, the purpose clearly is uh, if you read those articles, number one, as I said at the beginning, that we want uh, the internal market for information society services, and we don't want any artificial obstacles to that. So in principle, um, we would not want to impose uh, any uh, burdensome obligations on internet service providers, um, and that is reflected in Article 15 and so on and so forth, but already in this general exemption in Article 14. On the other hand, what we also want, of course, is that 
uh, if there is illegal content, that that illegal content uh, disappears. I mean, that's also as much in the in the interest of society as as is the uh, the legitimate uh, request for for having a free internet. Um, now there is there is many different ways between black and white, and, and many stakeholders have taken different views on this, where to draw the line. Um, it is obvious that some, some, some forms of illegal content uh, have stronger economic interests behind them. Yeah? So that's, I mean, we all know that we are talking about IPR infringements here, uh, because there's a very strong economic interest uh, driving the agenda in a certain direction. Um, the, the clear cut answer there is, is one of proportionality, and if you carefully read, and I'm sure all of you have done that, if you carefully read the Scarlet Subham ruling of the court uh, earlier this month, no, it was, we're already in December, it was in November, um, it's all about proportionality and striking the right balance. Uh, and, and that is precisely what, what, what we are after also in, in our deliberations here. Now, to what extent uh, can self-regulation work? I mean, um, as a starting point, um, I would always be in favor of, of lighter regimes. There is no doubt about that. If there is self-regulation that, uh, that helps us to achieve our objectives, and, but that, that would also mean that, uh, that as you said, the, the IPR industry is equally happy with the results obtained, then all is fine. Yeah? But if we see that we cannot strike the, that balance that needs to be struck, um, then we need to consider what else can be done. So as a first instance, self-regulation is great, uh, but we have to monitor it. We have to see whether it, whether it helps us reach our policy objectives. And if not, we need to think about a plan B. In terms of international access or international, um, of, co of course, the international dimension we will have to look at as well, because it's obvious that we have um, that the e-commerce directive applies within the 27 member states. Um, what can be done if if uh, content is hosted elsewhere? We have no answer to this yet, but it's obviously part of our considerations. Yes, on the law enforcement, how to avoid it to be externalized, I think it's very clear that self and co-regulation, and by the way, I, I think that in fact self-regulation, when we speak about self and co-regulation, we always mean co-regulation, because co-regulation is a joint objective, a common objective, that is then pursued um, where then corporate actors see how they can comply to an objective, but an objective that matter to us as institution. And if a, a self-regulation exercise is about an objective that doesn't matter to us as institution, it's not in our radar screen at all. So as soon as it becomes in our radar screen and our attentional space, that means that by definition, I would say, or by construction, it is a co-regulation process. Otherwise, we wouldn't even know about it, in a sense. As soon as we have to know about it, to me, it becomes a co-regulation exercise, because at least the objective is shared. That doesn't mean that we intervene in how the stakeholders will arrange for compliance, but at least uh, we have a stake in the goal. So that being said, of course, if the co-regulation processes end up with a code of conduct and the compliance and the repeat offense and all that will not be in the judiciary in the tribunals. I think that we have to be very clear that there, what we play with is indeed reputation effect and reputation damage and maybe f fee if they want to, to, to make payments between actors, but it will not interfere with the judi judiciary as such. I think that would, to enter the judiciary, it has to come through another channel. I, well, that's m my vision at least, uh, so that it, it, it draw on different uh, resources from the public space, uh, and really, which is, I, I say, mainly the, the reputation issue. And that's where transparency and monitoring by third party is important, because in a sense, it produces a punishment, but not judiciary punishment, another form of punishment. So, so we tap into wi the wider public space uh, resources, and it does not substitute for what uh, should be treated in the tribunal, in, in the courts. But we have to be 
Yes, yeah, so, so for me, self and co-regulation should, should not, um, it's not a matter of externalizing law enforcement issues. Questions? Go ahead, and please introduce yourself. Thank you, so I'm Fabrizio Sestini. I'm a colleague of Nicole uh, in DG Information Society. Um, I just wanted to add uh, uh, more than a question, a comment. Uh, uh, to start with uh, from the issue of co-regulation, because uh, um, I understand that what we have been talking about in so far, actually, it is truly co-regulation and not self-regulation in the sense that uh, we are trying to regulate the behavior of users. And if that was a real uh, um, true self-regulation, the users themselves should uh, uh, regulate uh, uh, their activities. Now, th this is, of course, an extreme point of view, but uh, what uh, um, um, I want to get is uh, a link uh, with uh, a point that Nicole mentioned uh, uh, from the speech of uh, Madame Cruz on uh, uh, one of the internet essentials which talks about uh, um, internet must be pro-democracy. And so we must support the creation of bottom-up platforms for people to discuss and to communicate between themselves. And this is actually something that we are doing now. We are launching now an initiative uh, which we call collective awareness uh, platforms for uh, social innovation and for social change. And uh, this is something will be uh, probably uh, but, uh, uh, published in the next year uh, to support, uh, to, to fund, uh, and then to support the emergence of uh, bottom-up platforms for people to discuss based on the concepts of online social networks, based on uh, uh, co-production of knowledge, based on uh, uh, access to uh, the environment. Uh, which will provide a means for people to get uh, an extended awareness about what is going on in the world, what are the problems of the world, and what could be their behaviors in order to, uh, to contribute to sustainability issues ranging from democracy, from uh, health, uh, from environment, uh, and in a way then uh, also be a help uh, for a self-regulation, a real self-regulation coming from the users themselves. So this could be another perspective to tackle the, the issue. Thank you. Sounds wonderful. Questions? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yes, hello. My name is Kostas Rosoglu, uh, working for BEUK, the European Consumer Organization. I was a bit surprised because the focus on self-regulation and co-regulation was presented as part of the corporate responsibility, but we've seen efforts on self-regulation and co-regulation directly affecting fundamental rights, and I was glad that the 2001 a white paper on governance was mentioned because one of the conclusions of the white paper is that self-regulation and co-regulation are great, but not when fundamental rights of citizens and consumers are affected. And I raise this because, especially when it comes to IPR enforcement, we've seen efforts by the European Commission to promote co-regulation uh, co and self-regulation. There have been a number of stakeholder dialogues uh, trying to go to bypass the legal framework. I would just like to uh, check with the representatives of the European Commission whether this is still the case, whether they still believe that self-regulation and co-regulation is not relevant when fundamental rights are affected. Thank you. Yeah, lady in pink. Uh, thank you, Katarzyna Szymielewicz, Panopticon Foundation Poland. I would like to add uh, my voice to this comment. I wanted to say exactly the same, referring to what the Commission said, that self-regulation is, is good as long as industry agrees that they are willing to uh, endorse certain rules without going as far as to change the law, it's very important to remember that we cannot use that instrument if that affects fundamental rights. But I have another comment regarding notice and takedown um, reform and um, what, what we heard that the Commission is not reconsidering the general principles, rather looking into making that more precise. Uh, what we see in Poland, we see that especially courts have, uh, they do struggle in, in interpreting that law. There is a lot of a misconception or a lot of struggle about how to understand certain concepts and I can give you uh, certain examples for example hosting do we how we how far the hosting uh, does it include certain services like Google search engine when there is a copy of a website being created is that hosting or is that not is this simply caching or or mere uh, conduit so there are certain concepts that, uh, that really are important to be clarified another example the actual knowledge and how that impacts 
responsibilities. Certain courts in Poland understand that if uh, an ISP monitors, for example, a forum and uh, deletes offensive words, that's already complex monitoring, which would imply the knowledge of, for example, IPR infringements, which is, uh, I would say, absurd interpretation, but we see things like that. Or another problem, uh, which you kindly mentioned, that uh, what kind of remedies users have if the content gets deleted um, in contradiction with the law? Do we only have civil measures like simple damages, which for a free of charge service is extremely difficult to claim? Or do we want to invent new remedies that will s secure freedom of speech and secure users' rights uh, versus certain uh, powerful intermediaries? So there are numerous problems which I'm happy to, to, to refer to later, or I think we will have many opportunities to write them and send it to the Commission, which should be reconsidered not only uh, the structure of notice and takedown. Thank you. Yes, uh, on the first one, and, and also to mention that you ask for questions. Uh, uh, it's not only questions, but it's, it's comments and intake, because I have to say that the, this type of event is also where we, we, we get signals about what, what matters for, for stakeholders. So, so your point on fundamental right, let me reassure you that yes, of course, uh, this remain. Uh, but, but I, I, I take your input as a, as, a, as, as a need to remain cautious about that. And, and I want to just, again, insist on this articulation between self and co-regulation processes on the one hand and uh, law uh, on the other hand, is, is that, you know, I, I see that self and co-regulation is something to be tried out. In case it works, why then bother go uh, through a law which is, so it is, and as you know, it's more like, we, when we have to think about a measure, we go through a public consultation, we, we have impact assessment, and all this process leads sometimes to the uh, change of, of projects, like we have seen in the e-commerce directive, that we move from a revision to a communication, thanks to the public consultation. Uh, so so self and co-regulation is, 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 is only, is, there is not an active will to avoid regulation, it's just to be to be efficient and economical, if I may say so, with, with this process. And in fact, who will tell us if self and co-regulation work or not? Of course, it is the corporate actors who takes place in a trial of such a process, if they deliver or not. And then this is importance of the transparency as one of the good principles of such processes. If they do not uh, convince that they will be efficient and they, uh, of course, then they are as if they did not exist. So it's only if they convince and if the um, corporations taking part in it are accountable for what they promise and what they promise is significant for the public opinion that this exercise uh, can be deemed to be can deemed to be um, are deemed to be successful. So so I really think we have to engage with uh, envisage self and co-regulation in a non-defensive way. Uh, because of all these uh, transparency and third party accountability measures. And, and, and really, I believe that if these are uh, effective, uh, it can really be a good way to, to engage the people uh, who know best maybe what are the best means to achieve these objectives. So, so it may also open more effective way in some cases, not all the time, of course. It was probably unclear when I when I referred to self-regulation that we're happy as long uh, as, as industry is happy with it. What I was actually saying was uh, self-regulation is good as long as it helps us to achieve our policy objectives. And in a particular case, our policy objectives are the, the single market as well as the respect of the fundamental freedoms. It's, it's, it's an intrinsic part of the e-commerce directive. So that's what I was saying, yeah? as long as, as the regulator doesn't have to intervene because the public interest is already preserved, well, then, then I prefer self-regulation to regulation. That was my statement. Now, um, some concepts may need clarification, you said, uh, on the different types of services, on other types of language used in a directive. I would agree with you on that, that in an ideal world, um, we should indeed open up the directive and do some, some clarification here and there. Um, however, the, the overwhelming assessment by consultees was 
that the risk of losing some of the fundamental principles that are in the directive would be bigger than the gains that can be obtained from clarifying a bit in the margins. Now, this clarification, uh, to the extent that we can't do, can't do it by changing the directive, already takes place through court rulings. Of course, it's a piecemeal approach, but I think the court has already clarified a few things, and I, I mentioned them before, um, that, that provide much more guidance already for us than, than we had before those court rulings. And last but not least, um, even if we just look into the procedures, we can still, uh, at that level, uh, introduce some things that, that can help. Uh, if, for instance, uh, a notice yeah, in order to, for an for, for in, in, um, internet service provider to obtain actual knowledge, if it is clarified what's, what the notice would have to look like, what quality criteria such a notice has to meet, that is already one step forward. If we clarify, for instance, that, um, that the, the person having provided that content needs to be consulted properly, that's a step forward. If we clarify what has to happen if legal content was taken down uh, erroneously, uh, so if we go through the entire process, we can already also at that level introduce lots of checks and balances that make that whole process more fair and more transparent, I think. Hello, I'm Jeremy Zimmerman, co-founder and spokesperson of Citizen Advocacy Group La Quadrature du Net. Um, I'm just wondering how we could possibly um, protect such a fundamental right as the right to a fair trial with self-regulation. Um, we, we've all read the um, uh, Sabam Scarlet decision in which the ECJ uh, forbids a court to order a generalized obligation of monitoring. Well, in practice, such a company as Google already put in place such a general monitoring on its YouTube service with, with the Content ID platform, which proactively, preventively scan every uploaded material in search for uh, images belonging to some copyrighted material, therefore forbidding to publish parodies and other kind of fair use exceptions made out of those works through transformative works. So. Um, in that context, um, I really don't see how uh, guidelines on the current uh, procedures could make the situation evolve in the right direction. I see uh, that in Canada and I think in Japan is this procedure of notice and notice, where after uh, being noticed, the operator sends a notice to the user himself who can eventually reply and if it doesn't, the, the content is taken down. But if he replies, then the case is taken to a court. And in my view, this is the only way to uh, clear cases as complex as uh, copyright infringement that very often uh, require uh, long procedure, long cases, uh, expertise. And a company cannot have an incentive to do anything else than going to the most essential, simplest, uh, technically and economically efficient procedure that is a removal and when they have the choice between removing the material or asking their legal service to assess the veracity of a claim or a notice, the, the choice is clear cut. Any more questions for this panel? Yeah, go ahead. I'm just going to look around because then we can round off afterwards. Yeah, one, two more questions and then we'll, three more questions, then we'll finish this panel. Hello, uh, good afternoon. I'm Jean-Christophe Finidori. I'm an internet consultant uh, specialized in internet uh, governance. Uh, I don't represent uh, any kind of stakeholders. And uh, first of all, I have to say that this is my very first question to EU officials, so be indulgent uh, with me. Uh, my question is to uh, the lady, I don't remember your name, I'm terribly sorry. Mr. Um, <laughs> you've mentioned um, the multi-stakeholder models uh, in different sectors. Uh, including the internet, um, but uh, it seems that uh, this model, uh, this organization already exists. Is the ICANN uh, since uh, '98? This is a 
purely multi-stakeholder model and it rules, if I can say, say that, the internet since 98, but previously the, with, through the IANA. Um, my question is, uh, do you want to, to uh, create a European ICANN or do you want uh, to try to block uh, the, the contract uh, uh, who, regule, uh, who deal uh, the ICANN with the US government uh, for the next 10 years? Uh, what's the position, what's your position about that, the ICANN, the multi-stakeholders to rule the internet? Thank you very much. Uh, Erik Josefsson from uh, the Green Group. I'm advisor on internet policies. I, I just wanted to connect to the question from Böck regarding fundamental rights and, and uh, um, uh, self and co-regulation. Uh, it was mentioned uh, in a 2001 paper, as I understood it. It's also uh, the case that the uh, 2003 interinstitutional agreement is actually uh, precluding the Commission from supporting self and co-regulatory mechanisms where fundamental rights, such as the right to freedom of expression, are at stake. Now, supporting is, of course, a, a word you can discuss. Uh, you can maybe assist or, or in other ways, uh, uh, talk about self and co-regulatory mechanisms. But uh, do, do you have, are you considering uh, in your work on this this interinstitutional agreement from 2003. It becomes a very technical question, I know that, but uh, uh, it is the case that, that this uh, agreement exists and it, it uh, precludes the Commission from supporting uh, self-regulatory mechanisms uh, in the cases where fundamental rights are involved. If, if you could just comment on that very shortly without becoming too technical. Thank you. I don't have that much of a question, but the reply to comment. Uh, I can wait till the end to do reply and then comment back to the question. Why don't you go ahead and say everything okay, you want I'll to say? Okay, I'll try now. to be as short as possible. Uh, one issue in general and one issue in particular. One issue in general, it's hard to find a company, I think, and I have concrete examples. I can also send you by emails, who is such a supporter of free speech and generally try to strike a balance between free speech and copyright uh, enforcement. As concerned to your example, every minute there are 48 hours of content uploaded on YouTube, which means there has to be some kind of software by which we can see, because there is no human who can actually monitor this. Google is somewhere in between, between copyright enforcement and the user. Of course, our concern is the user, and every time we have a new solicitation in terms of getting some for, something down from the internet, we make sure that we have something from a relevant authority. That's my comment, thank you. Okay, those were questions, and I'll give the final word to both panelists, and then uh, we'll move to the next panel. You want a short comment? Okay, go ahead. Huh? A new question, okay. Sorry, just one more question um, about the you know, track mechanism you, you mentioned. Uh, I would ask for clarification how the Commission, um, because we have so-called cookie directive that is sort of regulating uh, the question of tracking, which poses a lot of controversies now, a lot of debate. So would the Commission rather go towards self-regulation in this area or making existing regulation like the directive I mentioned more clear? Would you mentioned the do not track mechanism will be explored as self-regulation, while at the same time we have um, the directive which regulates that area somehow, and the regulation poses a lot of controversies. So that's why I understand why there is more need for, for clarification of what exactly is required from the business. For example, does the business have to obtain co prior consent from the user to serve a cookie? Uh, personally, I would like to see more regulation here rather than self-regulation because of the con controversies we see. But because you mentioned self-regulation, I would like to know exactly what the Commission take on this. Thank you. So uh, first on 
on the link between fair trial and self-regulation, I, I really, again, it comes to the articulation and what I call the complementarity between self-regulation exercise and um, lawmaking. I, I, I don't consider that for the moment, uh, for example, uh, self-regulation, <laughs> I mean, self-regulation is an exercise a structured exercise, so it's not what applies, uh, you know, between the norms or something like that. It is a structured exercise with, with a commitment at the end, a code of conduct or something that can be. So, of course, it will not, it should never prevent anybody from a fair trial, because fair trials are to be um, uh, are t taking place on the basis of law. And, and, and law exists. So, so where there is to be fair trial, there should be. And where there is self-regulation, uh, it's a different form of check, and, of check and balance of compliance. It's a different regime for me. So I, I really don't see uh, self-regulation as a way to take away uh, fair trials in any means. I mean, they, so I don't know if this uh, answers your concern or not, but... <coughs> Uh, yes, and, and, and really self-regulations are structured exercise that has to be visible and cannot be considered as what is there uh, when it's not formally uh, a law or it is a practice happening. No, it, it has to be a structured exercise. Now, <clears throat> on, um, on the I can think, uh, no, the multi-stakeholder, well, Nelly Cruz expressed that she has concern with the way ICANN functions for the moment in, in, in several occasions. And uh, indeed, we think that uh, more, more uh, account should, uh, ICANN should take more into account uh, preoccupations of, um, of Europeans uh, and European member states. Uh, so in, there is a, a discussion there, but there is no willingness to to do another ICANN or separate a European one or not at all. Uh, there is a discussion, and the multi-stakeholder multi platform we mentioned uh, would be to address issues beyond what ICANN is really uh, is is doing, or other issues of governance beyond what is dealt with uh, within ICANN. Now uh, on. And the, uh, on the OBA, on online behavioral advertising, what is expected in the self-regulation exercise is to come up with something which is a, a practice, a proposal that would allow uh, each of us to, to see very clearly, uh, to, to make an easy choice, either by you know, an, an, an easy button recognizable or something like that. So, and, and the circumstances in which it appear and when it's pop up and when it's tick and all that, the, the discussion is about that, but, but of course, uh, what we, what will, uh, the context will be established by uh, the, the privacy legal framework. And, and you know that we are heading towards a, a proposal from the commission on, on this issue in January, end of January. So the self-regulation will not uh, substitute and for, for this and will, will be in aligned um, and go beyond what is requested by this legal text. So there is no, the legal text uh, will, will not, um, yes, it, it, self-regulation will be on top of this, that, that's what I mean, and not substitute for it. And the, and the interinstitutional agreement, could you answer that too? 2003 interinstitutional agreement. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Your technical questions. Uh, no, was it? I, I didn't hear well. Um, and I so the 2003 interinstitutional agreement precludes the Commission from pr uh, promoting self-regulatory uh, mechanisms. About fundamental rights, you mean? Yeah. yeah. Yes, but this is. Moving in fundamental rights, yes. Uh, as was commented by Böck, referring to an earlier paper from 2001. But I can only repeat that uh, this, the position of the Commission has not changed, and of course we do not uh, recommend uh, self-regulation where fundamental rights are at stake, so indeed. Uh, uh, but if you are meaning that this is the case, please tell me where you think there is a self-regulation exercise which is which is uh, putting fundamental rights in danger.
Well, that is the question, uh, whether you have, how you assess that you respect the interinstitutional agreement in this area. Uh, if you do, if you, how you consider, how do you pr process the issue that you're bound by an interinstitutional agreement, uh, not to uh, support self and co-regulatory mechanisms where fundamental rights are involved. That was the question. Just how do you deal with that uh, interinstitutional agreement from 2003? Well, you know, <laughs> if you can help, the on top of it, the fundamental right now are in the, ch yeah, the charter of fundamental right is in the treaty. So, so of course, self-regulation exercise cannot breach, uh, cannot breach the treaty. Well, uh, so I, I don't see the point. But again, if you think that we are doing such a thing, please tell me. Just on some of the other issues raised very briefly, La Quadratudi Net uh, was referring to the general uh, monitoring that players like Google would already be carrying out. Just to clarify, from, from our point of view, looking at the e-commerce directive and the liability exemption, uh, our starting point is that there is uh, member states shall not impose shall not impose a general obligation. The, the current legislation does not say that internet service providers are not allowed to do that. Yeah? So, I mean, it's a bit outside, which also sort of probably means that um, this piece of legislation certainly uh, does not cover all these aspects you would want to see covered, but we, we live in a, in a broader legal system where, where other checks and balances are in place, and that can be anything from competition law down to data protection law and many others. Yeah? So, we are just dealing with one particular part of the puzzle and we are trying to, to optimize its use in this in this game. Uh, you also mentioned notice and notice. Uh, this is precisely the sort of issues that we are screening right now. So when I said that we are going out now and see what is in place, what is being used, what systems are there, what are the advantages, what are the disadvantages, that is exactly what we are doing. And the next stage will then be to see, all right, is there anything that we feel confident enough to, to recommend? And then we come to the, uh, the last stage will be about any legal or not legal instrument to achieve those objectives. Yeah? Normally, when you look into impact assessment guidelines of the Commission, you would then always have to look into no action or soft law or anything else, any type of law. And at that stage, we will then be confronted with any question, are certain options available in the first place? Or, uh, as you said, uh, if uh, self-regulation is not an option where, where, where fundamental rights are concerned, well, that will then come into play at this, at this stage. But we're at the moment at the stage of finding good practice out there that will help us reach our policy objectives. All right, let me then add, uh, thank the two uh, first speakers very, very much for, for coming and answering uh, the sometimes difficult questions. Um, as we were talking, I decided to do a small poll on Twitter uh, to see who should uh, regulate internet and so maybe we can do it here as well so there's four options I'll propose first and then you can take a vote uh, who should regulate internet uh, the government one the business community two both three or none four so uh, who should regulate internet one you should repeat your options. The, which is the government Two is the business community, who votes for two? <laughs> Great, <laughs> it's quite revealing. Um, three, both. And then four, none. Okay, so on Twitter almost everybody said none. Uh, and perhaps our challenge today is to see where the balance is uh, when we have to find one and uh, what are the appropriate. Uh, after the people from the Commission spoke, we've also learned that we're now uh, not going to have any more PowerPoint presentations, so that's interesting. Um, I'm going to ask you to have a short introduction, each of you, uh, so that we can continue uh, our discussion from uh, your different perspectives uh, quite quickly. Uh, so I'll start with Chris Active, who is the General Counsel for the Warner Group. Uh, this means he's responsible for all of the group's legal and business affairs activities outside of the U.S. 
Thank you. Thank you very much for, uh, for inviting me. I did actually have a PowerPoint, and then when I looked at it again, I thought it was so boring. I was so bored by it that I wouldn't inflict it on you. you. So there is no, there is no PowerPoint. Um, I think one of the things that I hear said most often about the business that I represent, the music business, is that we don't need to really worry about what happens on the internet. We just need to fix our business model. That our business model is broken. If we could just fix the business model, everything would be fine. Well, I don't actually happen to think our business model is broken. Um, I think the internet for us presents enormous opportunities. Um, but it also presents significant challenges. It, for us, it's an amazing tool because it enables us to disseminate our music and our artists' music at a touch of a button. But at the same time, it enables other people who invest absolutely nothing in our business to um, profit from the wholesale theft of, of what our artists do. Our industry has changed, I think, further and faster than most any other business in the last 15 years in the digital economy. We were a business a few years ago whose revenue was derived almost entirely from selling pieces of plastic with holes in the middle um, to one today where about a third of our revenues are generated digitally by the sale of music online. And when I bought the first record that I ever bought, which was back in 1974, which I know you'll find hard to believe, um, uh, you could buy that as a piece of vinyl or you could buy that as a cassette. And today you can buy that same piece of music in about 200 different formats, most of them digital. Um, the other thing I should say is I paid 75p for my single, first single record, and the price is about 75p today, formed 40 years later. There are about 400 licensed services around the world um, selling 15 million tracks, which is pretty much all of the music in the world. And of those services, 250 of them, approximately, are based in the EU. And the number of new services is growing all of the time. And those are services that enable you to download albums and singles um, in a matter of seconds, to be able to listen to all of the world's music on a monthly subscription for less than the price of a couple of cups of coffee. Um, they will give you access effectively to a celestial jukebox of all of the world's music. Um, 300 million people today own iPods. There are 10 million subscribers to Spotify, a service which wasn't even around three years ago. And that is one of the most innovative services I think you'll find on, on the market today. And I don't think those services would exist if we had really turned our back on the um, digital market, on technological developments. But the ability to grow our business and to help those digital startup businesses, which are mostly SMEs, by the way, um, it, it, those efforts are severely hampered by, by the pirate services. They undermine the commercial vi viability of everything we do. Um, we estimate that today, still around 95% of all of the music that's being accessed online comes from illegal sources, and no business could ever tolerate that. Um, but we do, so we really do know, though, that to beat piracy, um, you need carrots as well as sticks. Um, uh, we also know that carrots are better than sticks. Um, but we believe that many people besides us have a role to play in helping a legal market on the internet uh, to flourish. That obviously means ISPs. Uh, as one of the players, we think if we identify a site which is clearly illegal, which makes, um, it, which has been set up for the sole purpose of making our intellectual property available online without any compensation to us or to our artists or to our writers, I don't think it's actually unreasonable to ask uh, an ISP to block access to a website which exists totally for the purpose of, uh, of, of making our music available illegally. European Parliament agrees with us. Article 8.3 of the Copyright Directive requires member states to ensure that rights holders are in a position to apply for an injunction against intermediaries whose services are being used by a third party to infringe copyright. The courts of the member states agree with us, as recent decisions against Newsbin in the United Kingdom, uh, and more particularly against the Pirate Bay in Italy, in Denmark, in Finland, and recently here in Belgium, have all shown. We think the search engines have a role to play as well. Um, yesterday, before I came over here, um, I did a search, actually it was on Google, um, where I typed in the words Plan B, that's one of our artists, and the word MP3. And of the first 20 search results that came up, 18 were for pirate websites. Only two were for legitimate websites. Um, 
Then there are the credit card companies. Uh, the credit card companies are today making their services available to a lot of websites um, that actually look legal. They charge the consumer for access to content. The consumer pays in good faith. Um, but actually what they're getting is uh, a totally unauthorized copy of the work um, for which neither we nor our artists nor any of the original creators get paid. Um, in the UK, we've worked with the credit card companies um, to stop providing credit card services to those sites. We need to see that happen more widely. Um, then there are the advertisers. A lot of these illegal sites have advertising on them. Um, that's where they get a lot of their, their sources of revenue from. We'd like advertisers to work more closely with us to make sure that their products are not advertised um, on the sites that, that uh, are uh, offering our content illegally. Um, in a number of countries, as, as you know, governments have introduced a series of escalating sanctions to alert consumers to illegal behavior online and to address web piracy. In most cases, all it really takes is one written warning to persuade people not to download music from sources they know that are illegal. And only in a very few cases do we think any further sanction would be necessary. And we don't think it's just for our benefit either. Um, we already know that broadband providers manage their network traffic at times of peak demand. Um, peaks in large part um, by people downloading content illegally, particularly in the evenings. That's why often you'll find your broadband speed slow right down in the evenings. Um, we also think that kind of program works. So in countries such as France uh, and in Korea, where those kind of programs exist, um, sales of legitimate music now exceed those of uh, illegal music and piracy levels are significantly down by comparison to, to markets where those kind of programs don't exist. We also think ISPs have much to gain commercially by working with us, um, and we think that digital platforms can help them uh, improve their offer to their own consumers. Partnerships already exist um, between Spotify and Virgin Media in the UK, with KPN in Holland, with uh, Telia in Sweden, Deezer working with Orange in France. There are a number of these services all over Europe. And we think there are de these are deals where everybody wins. We think the consumer gets a great and simple and reasonably low-priced service bundled with their broadband. The ISPs get a whole new revenue source. And our artists and our writers, more importantly, get paid for their creativity. In fact, the only losers in those deals are the internet pirates um, who get cut out of the loop for once. Um, we expect to see a lot more of these services rolled out over the, um, over the next year or two. So, I think I'd like to sort of move the debate away from a them versus us and whose fault it is, whose responsibility it is, to a more cooperative commercial relationship that we can all benefit from. And I think just finally, just to touch on and come back to the sort of the issue of self-regulation. Um, well, yes, uh, I also believe self-regulation and less regulatory and less legal intervention is a good thing where possible. I think voluntary arrangements tend to work better in, in cohesive, linguistically homogenous markets such as the United States. Um, I think it's more difficult in a market of 27 individual member states. And here, I think, in, in the EU, I think we do need to see a coherent set of guiding principles towards a consistent approach without necessarily imposing specific solutions in any one market. Um, Commissioner Barney, I think, next year will um, be uh, issuing his review of the enforcement directive. Um, I hope that will enable us to have a clear framework which, from which we can all benefit, content owners, online businesses, uh, and more particularly, ultimately, the consumer. Thank, Thank you. you. I'm going to hold my questions. Uh, and I'll give the floor to Joe. Back the Thank you very much. Um, the last thing that I was expecting from FP was a speech that pirates could, uh, could sign up to. I think uh, a lot of pirates would be perfectly happy with the uh, concept of ineffective blocks being put in place that they can happily work around and everyone can continue on as if nothing ever happened. So uh, it's, uh, it's nice to see that it's not them and us. There's a, there's a certain rapprochement in, uh, in approach, if not in philosophy, which is nice. Um, I think we're, we're suffering a little bit of lack of vocabulary when it comes to self-regulation because there are are, there's a very wide spectrum of things that are called self-regulation, which are actually entirely different from each other. Um, on the one hand, you have the development of HTML uh, standards where uh, industry users get together to create a standard, and that's self-regulation. It works terribly well. It works terribly well because it's an internal process. 
um, companies know what they need to do uh, to manage their own uh, services to regulate themselves to be effect efficient. You also have entirely external processes that are also called self-regulation. So the uh, illegal three strikes regime in, in Ireland, for example, is called self-regulation. It is uh, policing of the customers in order to defend external interests. Entirely internal processes can be effectively self-regulated. Entirely external processes can't be uh, effectively uh, self-regulated. And the more external the process is, the less it is self-regulation and the less effective it's going to be. There are numerous myths, uh, and um, thank you for already listing some of them, um, on which this uh, self-regulation uh, um, drive uh, is based. So I'm going to quickly rush through uh, 10 of them. Uh, the first one is that this self-regulation issue is a narrow European issue. Uh, issue on a, a particular part of, of industry. In fact, there's a whole avalanche of outsourcing of um, policing online. Um, there are measures from the European Commission, from the OECD, in the Trans-Pacific Partnership, and uh, only last week the bastion of democratic values, the Russian Federation, uh, announced in WIPO that it wants to uh, introduce more obligations and internet providers to police the internet. And uh, the uh, IFB uh, welcomed this uh, measure from, from the Russian Federation. Uh, in other news from Russia last week, Reporters Without Borders issued severe criticism of the anti-democratic interferences in that country with online media. The second issue, which is also important, also in the IPR Enforcement Directive, uh, is the idea that notice and action uh, creates no jurisdictional issues. Um, but if we look at what companies are expected to take action, the search engines, the payment providers, the uh, advertising networks, payment providers, the main ones, are American. The search engines are mainly American. And that means that this approach risks, creates a very heavy risk of actually outsourcing our free speech and our democracy to American companies. And we see this already with uh, apologies to, for picking on Google again, uh, but if you, if you make a complaint to Google under the US uh, Digital Millennium Copyright Act, they de-index de the content for the whole world, even though the, uh, the complaint was under US law. Uh, the third um, myth is that ISPs are too evil to be trusted with copyright and so good that they can be trusted with freedom of speech. Uh, we've all he heard going back uh, for quite a long time that internet providers are parasites, they're getting rich on uh, this uh, so-called piracy that happens on the internet and so uh, this can't continue. So what we, what we can do is we can put them in charge of freedom of speech because they're so bad, they can't be trusted with copyright, but they're so good, they can be trusted with freedom of speech and democracy. Um, one of the, those two uh, statements, or possibly both of them, uh, is not completely true. The fourth point is that intermediaries are in a perfectly balanced position to make rulings on illegality. <clears throat> There's this weird idea that today, tomorrow, and forevermore, internet uh, intermediaries are perfectly placed to make fair and balanced decisions about what we're allowed to do online. In reality, and this is going to come as no surprise, businesses make decisions based on business priorities. So uh, when the WikiLeaks case happened in the United States, senior politicians described uh, WikiLeaks as a terrorist organization. And uh, Visa, MasterCard, PayPal, Amazon, their uh, internet uh, domain name registrar, all withdrew services. Not because WikiLeaks had done something illegal, they were, weren't even accused of doing something illegal. They, they had their services removed because it was in the, a public relations benefit for those companies to take vigilante action against that organization at that moment. 
The fifth point is that intermediaries will be able to devote enough resources to policing all of us uh, to avoid never-ending problems. Um, in the UK, Yahoo, um, who even had a member of the board uh, of the Internet Watch Foundation currently in, in place at the time, um, ended up having its photo sharing site, Flickr, blocked by uh, several internet providers. How did the entire service end up being blocked? Because the Internet Watch Foundation said that one of the 51 million subscribers to, uh, to Flickr had uploaded uh, content that may be illegal. In Germany, the uh, wonderfully named Gesellschaft zur Verfolgung von Urheberrechtsverletzungen, which is the Society for Prosecution of Copyright Infringement, persuaded Vimeo, the online video company, to delete four uh, um, videos. This organization didn't own the, uh, the videos. They had no rights relation to the video. The videos were completely legal, but simply by making a complaint, they were able to take them down. The sixth point is uh, an interesting one in that copyright interests assume they can ask internet providers to do anything and there's going to be no unintended consequences. Um, IFB, uh, a few years ago, uh, entered into an agreement with internet providers in Belgium to delete 10 internet news groups every week if IFB said that they were illegal. So week after week, IFB identified uh, news groups and the internet providers diligently deleted them. These lists appeared on the internet and the pirates of Belgium rejoiced that IFB had kindly identified the best places to find uh, unauthorized music on the internet for them. Ultimately, IFB got bored of providing a service broadly similar to the Pirate Bay and stopped doing it. Uh, a few weeks ago, the um, Belgian Anti-Piracy Federation uh, went to court to demand the Telenet and um, Belgacom start blocking Pirate Bay. Uh, it attracted a little bit of, of publicity, not an awful lot. Within hours, depiratenbay.be was set up. So when the direct block was put in place, people went through the Belgian Pirate Bay to get to the real Pirate Bay. Um, what was the result? The result was far more young people found out about the Pirate Bay. Um, far more young people laughed at a legal system that's obviously not fit for purpose, uh, administered by judges who don't understand the internet, um, at the request of organizations that patently don't understand the internet. There's also a misunderstanding that there's no risk of unintended consequences for the online marketplace as a whole. We end up in a bizarre situation where the European Union is making very strong statements that there must be net neutrality, there must be search neutrality. Internet companies should not be allowed to interfere with traffic for their own business purposes. I agree completely. However, the European Commission is also saying internet providers must interfere with traffic for other people's interests. Well, that's not tenable. And uh, one of those two priorities is going to have to give way. As mentioned earlier, there's a question mark over uh, legality of, um, of so-called self-regulation measures. To give an example uh, from earlier, um, what type of thing is breaching the 2003 Interinstitutional Agreement? In ACTA, which is being pushed heavily by the European Commission at the moment, there is a, an obligation on parties to support um, cooperative enforcement of civil and criminal law by the private sector. Um, this is, a, for me, a black and white obvious breach of an obligation not to support um, extrajudicial self-regulatory measures. Um, the European uh, Convention on Human Rights uh, says that you can't in, uh, infringe um, freedom of communication and, free and, and privacy uh, outside the rule of law. So does the Charter of Human Fundamental Rights. So does the International Covenant on Civil and, and Political Rights. Uh, I'm nearly finished. Um, the, the ninth of, of the misunderstandings is uh, that we can do all this without damaging Europe's interests. Well, 
China has the world's best uh, online protectionism uh, system. It protects its own market by informal arrangements with internet pro providers. We now have a situation that the European Union has taken the world's most effective online protectionism system and put it in a trade agreement, ACTA, and is trying to roll that out across the world. That makes no sense to our business interests. And the final point is that policymakers have reflected enough on, on this. They haven't. A, um, a classified document that's going to be published next year by an international uh, economic organization uh, has assessed that policymakers need to understand the role of intermediaries in economic processes when designing new rules about internet intermediaries. If policymakers don't understand yet the complex role of internet intermediaries, it's too early to make far-reaching policies that, may, that bring such major societal and economic risks. It is very difficult to understand why we're gambling the, fu the future of the democratic value of the internet. It's very difficult to understand why we're gambling the future of the economic value of the internet. And it's hard to understand how we have ended up in a situation where policy is being made based on guesses, half-truths, and just a few of the myths that I had time to go through today. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there will be some room for discussion, but uh, first we will uh, hear from Chris Smith, who is with um, ECSA. So go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd just like to start by uh, thanking Madam Sharp very kindly for inviting Exeter and myself to attend this and to speak in this debate. As a composer and a songwriter, and thus as a stakeholder in the IP debate, I am pleased and honoured to speak on behalf of Exeter, the European Composer and Songwriter Alliance. Uh, to tell you something of the organisation, its background, it was formed in 2007 and brought together composer organisations from 29 countries in three genre-focused pillars, representing pop music, concert music and film and audiovisual music. Within EXA, I represent my own national organisation, BASCA, the British Academy of Songwriters, Composers and Authors, which itself has over 2,000 members, including such names as Sir Paul McCartney, Sir Peter Maxwell Davis, Elton John, David Arnold, and rather further down the scale of global recognition myself. <laughs> Within EXA, we recognize that there is a narrow and difficult path to be trod through the minefield that is the online environment. A balance needs to be struck, for example, between the need to protect children and the imposition of unacceptable levels of censorship and online scrutiny. Another such balance to be established is between the desire to provide ready access to information and intellectual property and the need to protect that same intellectual property and to ensure that its owner is properly remunerated for it. We wouldn't wish to pretend that finding these balanced positions is or will be easy, whether they're to be achieved by self-regulation or imposed legislation, but we do believe that any argument that defends one single principle, whether it be complete freedom of access to everything all the time, or draconian levels of governance, while denying any validity in opposing points of view, is frankly naive and simplistic. To argue, for example, that not being allowed to download my music for free somehow impinges upon an individual's human rights is rather like me saying that my human rights are being unacceptably regulated by not being allowed to enter your house and take your television. On the other hand, we also recognize that to seek to impose levels of regulation that would effectively criminalize children for downloading my song is ill-judged and practically unworkable. However, we do feel that ISPs must take some responsibility for the environment that they have created and from which they profit. An online portal where goods or services can be acquired is no more or less than a shop. And if any shop offered my goods for sale without employing basic levels of security, such as CCTV or a store detective, I would feel that it was being negligent in the care of duty that it owed me. Laws already exist in the world of physical <coughs> commerce that could and probably should equally apply in the online environment. For example, 
the fact that it is illegal for children under a certain age to purchase alcohol is not going to stop many of those children from wanting to purchase alcohol, as I'm sure most of us remember only too well. Should we, in this context, make a criminal of the child who forges an ID and buys a bottle of beer, or should we rather enforce the existing legislation on the liquor store owner who persistently sells alcohol to children? Along with other rights-owning and rights-generating stakeholders, composers and songwriters have encountered at least as many challenges as they have opportunities thrown up by the explosive growth of the online digital marketplace. Not least of these is the alarming corresponding decline in the market for physical product. It's therefore becoming increasingly clear in the light of this shift in the market that if we are to make our way and survive economically as creators, we will have to do so in the online world. We are asked to exchange physical dollars for digital dimes. And yet even this exchange rate doesn't measure up when, for example, from my own experience, a piece of my own music performed online 537,420 times earned me the princely sum of 89 pence and generated such an enormous royalty statement that I was out of pocket by the time I printed it off. This is clearly not a sustainable state of affairs and brings to mind a phrase that I heard quoted here yesterday and which I offer to you in closing. If art feeds the soul, who feeds the artist? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, now, I would like to ask Malcolm Hottie uh, to speak. He's head of public affairs at uh, the London Internet Exchange, Links. I am. That's my day job, and they, who, they are who pay my salary. Although I was asked here as the president of Eurispa, the sorry um, about that, my fault. Eurispa being um, the European level association representing the interests of uh, the internet services providers across Europe um, through the national associations, of which Links is one. Um, and I'm here as essentially representing the interests of the intermediaries, the internet intermediaries whose job it is to sit between Edry and FP. And it really does feel like that a lot of the time. But the title that we were asked to speak to went broader than music, broader than copyright. It was about policing the internet and self-regulation. And as intermediaries, we face many calls for dealing with objectionable content and behavior, unlawful and illegal content and behavior. And I wonder how many stakeholders that are directly interested in those other forms are here today. I wonder if we have any libel lawyers in the audience, any members of the counter-terrorist police, or police that specialize in racism and xenophobia generally. Do we have any financial services regulators in the audience? or maybe gambling regulators and gaming commissioners. I wonder why I went directly from financial services to gambling. Um, tax inspectors as well, since we're talking about money. Child protection charities and child protection authorities. Regulators of medicines and medical products. Advertising standards authorities. I'm not going to go on forever. But there were an almost seemingly endless list of people that come to us with genuine grievances, genuine complaints about genuinely bad action, genuinely criminal content in many cases, or stuff that inf does infringe on other people's rights. So it's completely needs to be put aside any sense that, oh, well, we're just talking about something that's not really a problem here, if there was any sense of that. And if anybody thinks, oh, well, this is copyright, and actually, to be honest, the copyright industries, they're doing fine, so we don't have to need to worry about that, then I ask you to set that aside, because the issue is much broader. The issue is, what do we do about all this bad stuff? Coming now to self-regulation, we heard a couple of new self-regulatory initiatives that were mentioned, the um, forthcoming, the do not track one, and further extensions to Safer Kids initiative. But the intermediaries that I represent are involved in a number of, a considerable number of existing self-regulatory initiatives that I think I do consider are self-regulatory. In particularly 
the child protection space, our members spend a lot of time and effort making sure that they are not part of the problem. To remove the material that is child pornography material from their own systems to make sure that they are not hosting it. Setting up and funding, in many cases, hotlines for the rapid reporting of that material so that we can find out about it soon enough and get rid of it. A self-regulatory initiative. We have long had self-regulatory initiatives for the protection of our customers, alternative dispute resolution systems, for example, for resolving customer disputes. Certainly, underpinned by external regulation now in the telecoms package since the original telecoms package. But nonetheless, I would call it self-regulatory because it predated that and because in many and most cases, the protections given by that go beyond what is required by law because we want to regulate ourselves for the protection of our customers so our customers are treated fairly. In another area, the security field. CERTs and public-private partnerships for uh, uh, security, again, being extended by the new telecoms package when it's and as it becomes implemented. But these partnerships and CERTs have existed for many years, and we work actively in them, fund them, support them, provide data and information sharing to support all of these things for the protection of our networks and for the protection of you all self-regulation at work. I, I won't go through them all, but um, actually I will mention advertising being an example of something where it's not just our sector in the specialist area of our sector, but actually many businesses have self-regulatory initiatives in advertising standards, often complemented by external regulation. And um, new measures have been developed now, again being promoted or instigated by, possibly by the new telecoms package, but being taken well beyond that by the industry itself for transparency and traffic management techniques so that customers are well informed about the traffic management techniques that internet networks operate. What draws this together? And I would describe each of these as being successful examples of self-regulation. And what draws it together? Well, in my view, self-regulation works and can really be called that when the ultimate decision as to what you do and how you do it lies with the body that is being regulated. Self-regulation is regulation of the self. So the ultimate decision on the actions that we take, the scope of them, the procedures that we follow, ultimately lies with us. Otherwise, it's not self-regulation. It's external regulation. There's a place for both. Now, that's not to say that we don't listen and consult as to what that should be, but ultimately the authority to decide how far we will go and when it's appropriate for us to act has to be ourselves if it is reasonably to be called self-regulation. And this comes in and tends to lie when, when what I would call the three C's are in place, commitment, capability and competence. Commitment, obvious. It has to be something, an area where we are willing to see, to act and to act where we can. Capability, though, is important. It has to be an area where we are actually capable of making an effective difference. Both in absolute technical terms, do we really have the technical capability to act? And also something that often goes unspoken but needs to be made explicit. Do we have the capability to act without causing such overarching harm to other interests, other legitimate interests, maybe the innocent third parties, maybe the very fun functioning of the internet, or maybe crucial other interests that are at stake. And if that isn't there, then the capability isn't there. And if the capability isn't there, then you wouldn't expect to get a self-regulatory initiative supported by the industry. And the last one is competence, which is really a question of legitimacy, authority. Are we really the right people to be doing this? And that's come up in the discussion already, and in some cases it is, and in some cases we aren't, it is appropriate for us to be acting, and in some cases it's more questionable. In some cases it clearly goes beyond the call. Where, and certainly in questions where, uh, in issues where judicial processes and fundamental rights are closely invoked, then it does cause people to question whether we really have the competence to be making the decisions at stake. And it is easy to say that in all these cases, well, it's not, there's no fundamental right to engage in all these bad behaviours. 
There's no fundamental right to steal, as you mentioned a moment ago. Of course not. But there's the question of truth. Is it really true that that person was stealing? It's actually just an allegation. You say that he's stealing your content, but maybe he's got a license. Maybe it's his content. Maybe all sorts of things. We always have a tradition in Europe that before you are subject to serious sanction, there should be the right to be heard yourself, to make a defence for yourself, and to ha have a hearing before an independent, impartial party that is able to determine questions like the truth. When you've got two competing people saying, this is completely unjustified and illegal behaviour, and somebody else is saying, no, it's not, someone has to decide who's in the right. Is it really a case for self-regulatory bodies, for industry themselves to take on themselves the function of, of that, that primary judicial function? Not always, I would say. Not always. And what we are seeing recently, relatively recently, uh, is in Europe an increasing concern being raised about the way in which, uh, the possibility that intermediaries have to take on that function, either, whether that be um, on their, at their own behest, or more crucially, when they are called upon it by external regulation. And so we have seen um, a, a few new initiatives, a few new um, decisions that have come. Firstly, Article 13A, the telecoms package, for the first time introduced regulation of member states by, the, by Europe, by the European Union, of member states to the extent to which member states can require, by external regulation, intermediaries, such as the companies that I speak for, to um, take away or infringe upon um, the ability of end users to access online services and information systems online, and put in place safeguards that it be appropriate and proportionate and only where necessary, that there be appropriate um, procedural safeguards and that the respect the European Convention on Human Rights and the Charter of Fundamental Rights and Fundamental Freedoms, that there be judicial protection and due process, that there be the right to a prior fair and impartial hearing, including the right to be heard. These are new rights that have been granted to the citizen to protect against unwarranted external regulation of my members, but that impacts on the rights of third parties, of citizens. Another thing um, where the similar approach has been followed even more recently was in the Child Sex Sexual Exploitation Directive, where there was an original proposal from the Commission that there should be mandatory blocking of paedophile um, websites or, or such measures, and that the um, European Parliament um, decided and supported by the Commission and uh, by the um, Council and it has become law that instead blocking measures must be regulated where blocking measures are that we would not go down the route of having a European blocking system but what we would say and what they did find important was to regulate national blocking mechanisms. It's a minimal harmonisation directive but nonetheless it does say that those blocking measures for the first time are subject to a minimum standard of regulation to ensure that transparent procedures are followed, adequate safeguards are provided, and that there is the possibility of judicial recourse for those who are blocked, that users are informed so that they're capable of taking, having access to that judicial recourse, and that in any case the blocking should only be the minimum necessary restricted to what's necessary and proportionate. So we're seeing the development here of a body of concern that we need to be not only regulating the internet, but regulating the regulation of the internet. And I think we're, start, we're starting to see that to ensure a degree of balance. And the uh, uh, last um, new thing that I would mention is um, the uh, Saban Scarlet Extended case, which we've um, heard spoken to before. And I won't speak to the um, various things that are said in there on fundamental rights. Um, but there is one fundamental right that is mentioned there that might be overlooked by someone other than the com spokesman for the commercial interests of intermediaries, and that's the fun fundamental right of the commercial interests of the intermediaries, that 
<coughs> requiring ISPs, the court decided, to ins install complicated, costly, and permanent computer systems at their own expense in an attempt to protect somebody else's rights is itself an unwarranted infringement of the network provider's freedom to do business. And that that is a fundamental right that is also protected by the Charter of Fundamental Rights and Freedoms. And that was part of the court ruling. So when considering what should be done and how this should be regulated, we need to respect and remember the rights of the citizens, the rights of the accused and those people, and such interests, alongside the very legitimate rights of property holders, of the responsible law enforcement agencies and so forth. And we also need to remember the rights of the intermediary too. We are responsible businesses. We have respect for the law and respect for property. We have respect for the rule of law and for fundamental rights. <coughs> we also have responsibility in our own specific sphere to speak up for the protection of the internet itself and its capabilities and what it has to offer our society. And at this time of particular economic strain, speaking up for the protection of the, um, of the economic development that is possible through the enormous innovation that the internet makes possible is something that I feel that we have a responsibility to speak for too, to set alongside the very legitimate economic interests of what's actually a relatively discreet economic sector, the digital content industries. These things need to be balanced. Finally, we have one very particular responsibility to bring to the attention of policymakers. We, the operators of this telecommunications infrastructure, have a responsibility to keep it working. This is critical telecommunications infrastructure that it now increasingly underpins our society. And that we have a responsibility to point out when the technical measures that are advocated by those that are not operators and do not necessarily understand the full implications of what might seem reasonable magic or magic wand solutions would potentially have significant negative consequences for the reliability and capability of the information infrastructure. It's our responsibility to point that out to you, and I would respectfully suggest your responsibility to listen. Thank you. Well, that responsibility has been taken, I think. Uh, we're here to do not much else. Uh, and now to listen to the last speaker, um, which is uh, Jeremy Brooks, who after a career as a uh, which ended as a global managing partner um, with PricewaterhouseCoopers and uh, a lot of experience in the field of transparency in the business community, uh, is now uh, in the role of independent chair of the Global Network Initiative, which is one of those multi-stakeholder initiatives um, that has been developed to look at respecting uh, corporate global uh, responsibility um, as well as human rights issues on the Internet. So, uh, please. Well, thank you very much and good afternoon. I'm sorry you've had to listen for so long, um, but I'll uh, try and make it as interesting as I can. We talked um, uh, in the earlier part of the afternoon um, not only about self-regulation, but also about multi-stakeholder initiatives. Uh, we've now heard some uh, very detailed comments, which um, I certainly benefited from, uh, Malcolm, uh, on aspects of self-regulation and also some of the uh, newer uh, legal um, uh, decisions and findings which um, illustrate how complex many of the issues are that, that we're dealing with. And what uh, the Global Network Initiative is, is itself a self-regulatory mechanism uh, built up uh, from a multi-stakeholder group of four constituencies. The four constituencies are uh, the ICT companies themselves, uh, the uh, investors, mainly socially responsible investors, but not only. So those investors who are concerned uh, about uh, performance by the ICT industry. Then academics, uh, some of them very insightful and doing um, long-term work on the significance of the internet, its implications both in society and from a technical point of view. Uh, and then the final group, very important for Global Network Initiative, uh, the Human Rights uh, and other civil society organizations. And these 
four groups uh, came together really in response to a cry for help uh, now nearly four years ago from uh, the major ISPs operating in China uh, where they were being heavily criticized, uh, particularly by the human rights organizations, uh, for uh, being active there uh, and ignoring, in the view of the human rights civil society organizations, uh, fundamental rights uh, to freedom of expression uh, and privacy of internet users. Um, and out of that came a very deep debate uh, which uh, took place over about two years and resulted in a set of uh, principles, the GNI principles, um, supported by uh, implementation guidelines, so a set of guidance documents which uh, the companies can use in uh, striving for um, achieving the right uh, level of um, uh, upholding freedom of expression and uh, the um, privacy of the users uh, of their services, and um, finally a commitment both to say publicly what they're doing to comply with these principles and something that we're now going through for the first time, uh, which was called, I think, in the list of uh, qualities which um, Nicole mentioned in the first half of the afternoon monitoring. Uh, we call it independent assessment. Uh, it's currently um, being conducted uh, by the founding members, uh, Microsoft, Google, and Yahoo, uh, with uh, independent um, uh, lawyers and um, auditors who are looking at their performance uh, in the first round of independent assessment of their um, ability to put in place uh, procedures and systems which will enable them uh, to comply with the uh, principles. Um, an, an even more demanding stage will take place next year, which is that uh, having uh, signed off, uh, hopefully perhaps with some recommendations about improvements they can make uh, on uh, their procedures and systems in place, uh, the next stage will be, okay, let's now look at some specific cases and see how uh, those cases have been dealt with and whether the systems and procedures in place have given the right kind of uh, guidance and support uh, for the companies to have taken the right kind of decisions, difficult uh, though we all realize that they are. And uh, we're going through a learning process uh, in this assessment area. It's the first time that um, human rights for ICT companies have been assessed independently. Uh, and we've already come across uh, some quite interesting issues, both of uh, how do you assure the independence of um, a very large global organization uh, being assessed by a very large global organization itself. So we're, we're, we're solving those, those particular problems. Uh, a more important one is uh, a very uh, perhaps American issue, uh, which is that of legal privilege. Uh, and that will probably be a much more important uh, issue for us to get our minds around and find solutions for when we come to look at individual cases uh, where very, fre very frequently the legal department will uh, have a very strong uh, feeling of the need for control over that process and therefore um, uh, be rather restrictive in the amount of information that they will want to release to independent assessors. So I just give you that as a, as a little bit of a feeling for uh, how serious this process is. Uh, it's very innovative uh, and it's, it's unique in this particular industry and it's a learning process. Uh, we're going to be reporting on the results of this first round uh, of assessments uh, in the spring of uh, next year. Uh, by that time it will be complete. Uh, uh, so watch this space. Um, we're going to find it exciting and we hope that uh, it will be uh, very interesting for all of those who are watching carefully uh, this kind of multi-stakeholder uh, self-regulatory mechanism. Um, perhaps just um, uh, very quickly, uh, two or three of the sort of fundamental uh, ideas behind the Global Network Initiative. The, the first is the value of transparency. Uh, I mentioned that uh, the companies themselves are required to state publicly 
uh, what their positioning is, uh, but it goes much further than that. It goes to transparency for the users, uh, and an example would be where even in the very restrictive climate of China, um, Baidu, the, um, the Chinese uh, ISP, uh, has followed the examples from Microsoft and Google, uh, and they actually mark when you want to access websites uh, which are um, not uh, allowed under, under Chinese law, they, they actually put up a notice, Baidu that is, puts up a notice under Chinese law, we can't show you this content. So uh, that, that's a very minimal position, of course, uh, and uh, we work um, much further uh, together with governments uh, as an organization to try to obtain a greater uh, readiness of, of governments uh, to have less restrictions uh, and to have less uh, imposition of um, access to, um, to private, uh, private data uh, from, from users. Uh, so transparency is absolutely key. Um, another uh, fundamental uh, view would be that given the speed of change in the internet uh, and the very difficult discussions, such as the discussions we've been having today, uh, about the need for um, formal regulation of the internet, uh, perhaps self-regulation is one way uh, of keeping up uh, with the uh, quick changes that are taking place because uh, in the kind of environment uh, of um, an organization like the Global Network Initiative, uh, challenges can be discussed, uh, resolution can be found, changes can be made not that easily, but much more easily than through the political process, uh, and particularly the political process with 27 states that um, we're coping with in the EU. So um, uh, um, a call, if you like, uh, for self-regulation in a very uh, fast-moving environment, uh, which is uh, nimble of foot and better able to respond to the challenges uh, of, of the um, the changing technology and the changing marketplace. And uh, perhaps finally, uh, the recognition uh, by GNI that self-regulation does certainly not uh, replace due process uh, and uh, a very important role uh, for uh, formal regulation. Uh, and we heard many examples of that uh, from, from our previous speaker and much of that uh, would be, would be uh, uh, endorsed by, by GNI. Um, what, what GNI is beginning to do, and of course that depends on the representativeness of GNI, uh, currently we have only five corporate members, about 50 members in total, uh, so our membership from um, the investment community, which is growing quite fast, also from Europe, uh, from the NGO community and from academia, uh, is uh, stronger than the, the corporate community, but we have some very interesting uh, discussions which are currently taking place mainly in Europe uh, from, from potential members. Once we have a greater representative body from all of those constituencies, that will enable us to talk much more effectively on behalf of not just the ICT industry, but on behalf of society, because uh, we represent uh, the different interests uh, which are um, in society through the constituents that we have. And one, one example where we've recently been active, and I know uh, that's been uh, of quite some concern uh, also to many perhaps in this room, uh, is on the Stop uh, Online Piracy Act, and I'm sure that uh, a couple of our uh, speakers who, who represent um, uh, the um, intellectual property interests of, of the music industry uh, would be very strongly in favor of many aspects of that act. Um, in fact, GNI uh, is, of course, uh, fully um, uh, recognizing the legitimate needs uh, to protect those, those property rights, but at the same time uh, has um, called uh, to the attention of the U.S. legislators, which are uh, dealing with that, that particular act in Congress at the moment. Um, they, they've called uh, their attention to uh, the danger uh, of um, uh, requiring proactive monitoring uh, and policing of information uh, of, of their users um, and that this could be a dangerous precedent 
uh, for many other countries. Um, and uh, rather than that just being um, a simple statement, um, it, it's amazing how quickly um, uh, perhaps uh, ill, ill um, used uh, comments uh, in the West are picked up by more authoritarian regimes. Um, it's amazing how when uh, Cameron uh, talked about the need to regulate uh, the social networks after the, uh, the riots in London, how that was immediately picked up uh, in China uh, and commented upon favorably, you see uh, Western countries also need to uh, to regulate the internet in ways that they haven't yet done. So um, we're, we're very concerned uh, in GNI that the unintended consequences shouldn't, shouldn't move in that direction. Um, I'll, I'll really stop at that point, but I would, I would just like to um, uh, mention one uh, initiative that we are undertaking. Uh, we have been lucky enough to, to get some, some small funds to do some research, uh, and that research is going to be on the balance points um, between freedom of expression and, and privacy on the one hand uh, and uh, security and law enforcement on the other, recognizing that uh, many of um, government's concerns about security and law enforcement are legitimate. And so the question is, how do we find the right balance uh, between uh, the, the absolute uh, uh, freedom of expression and privacy needs on the one hand and legitimate uh, security and law enforcement needs of governments on the other. Um, we've already held one um, uh, multi-stakeholder uh, meeting in, in London uh, about two weeks ago. As the kickoff, uh, we'll be having another meeting in uh, um, January uh, in the US, uh, followed by a third meeting in March in India. Uh, this is then followed, um, um, is, is being followed by uh, experts looking at this, uh, uh, digesting the, the input from the meetings uh, and then coming out, we hope, with uh, uh, some valuable insight which again will give uh, some guidance uh, both to the GNI companies but more generally to the ICT community uh, and um, obviously we'll be more than delighted to share that. Uh, both with uh, with governments and, and all interested parties. So thank you. Thank you, and thank you all, and thank you uh, for being such a patient audience. Um, let me look around and see who has any questions. I'm going to take three at a time, and I'm going to ask everyone to uh, uh, introduce themselves. So one, two. All right. We'll start with these two uh, over here. Go ahead. Uh, yes, hello. Uh, for European Digital Rights. Um, I have a question for Mr. Ancliffe. Um, since you stated that um, piracy is a severe threat to your business, I was wondering, um, according to your annual reports, um, in 2001, the revenue of Warner Music Group was um, $3.2 million, uh, dollars, and in 2008, $3.5 million. Dollars. So I don't quite understand uh, your concern. If you could tell uh, And last year it was about 2.2, so you, you can pick whichever points in time you like. I mean, the recorded music business 10 years ago was, um, was worth um, about $30 billion. Um, last year it was worth about $17 billion. Um, there, is, there is no doubt that, that our business has been materially impacted by, by piracy. I, mean, I, I think it's... It, you know, it's very easy to um, to have a go at big business. We're not even a particularly big business. I think we think of ourselves as an SME. But I think what what you what do you have to <laughs> well a big SME a big SME. Um, but what, what what I think you have to remember is that creativity is something which Europe does incredibly well, um, better than I think most other regions of the world. Um, the creative economy in Europe. Last year, represented about 7% of GDP. Um, it employs about 14 million people in Europe. These are people's jobs. I mean, we, we think of it in terms of, of big business, but actually it, it really is about um, the jobs of millions of people and the livelihoods of millions of artists and, and, and writers. Uh, 
Thank you. Yes, to, to the, the, the line is indeed between self-regulation and compliance or liability. When I mean compliance in the condition for good practice is compliance to the code of conduct adopted, but I think that indeed self-regulation shouldn't be seen as a, as a way to subtract some area from, from uh, or creating a black box of automatic liability or compliance things on other things. So really when I meant compliance, doesn't mean compliance with the regulatory framework as it is. This of course remains fully uh, in the scope of, of the judiciary and, and the courts. So um, I, I really take from what I heard that indeed the liability thing is not an object of self-regulation per se, uh, but, but should really be, um, no, uh, different, distinct, and, and have their own objective. Now, my question then to, to Jeremy would be, uh, or can you tell me the extent to which you fix, obje uh, what are the objective of, of the self-regulation exercise? Do you, uh, are they clearly spelled out, or is it more a sort of um, thinking what's good behavior, what should we do, or so, yes, to what extent do you really clearly identify the objective you're striving for uh, at the beginning of the exercise. Um, well, th thank you. Um, I, I should have brought that out more clearly in, in my quick introduction. Um, the, the, the objectives at the high level are uh, to uh, enable the ICT industry to uphold and promote freedom of expression and uh, privacy for users on the basis that uh, these two human rights will form the basis for the most creative development uh, of uh, the internet for the benefit of all. So at the high level, that is, that is its objective. Um, clearly, there are um, sub-aims, and uh, I think I probably brought that out more clearly by saying that uh, the purpose of the formulation of the principles and particularly of the implementation guidelines and of the whole assessment process is to enable companies to learn exactly what that means in practice, how do they implement uh, these nice sounding uh, principles and how do they then deal with uh, government um, imposition of rules um, which may or may not be in line with international human rights standards. So that is, um, in a nutshell, what uh, the GNI is trying to achieve. Um, Jeremy Zimmerman, again, La Quadrature du Net. I'm um, more and more disturbed uh, by hearing this term self-regulation, where I more and more hear um, the term um, privatized regulation or privatized enforcement. And I'm uh, especially worried um, when the, the music industry represented here kept blurring the lines along the years between what is uh, for-profit copyright infringement and not for-profit copyright infringement. In that context, I wonder how proportionality of measures to be taken can be assessed. So after um, combating um, uh, non-for-profit sharing between individuals through peer-to-peer -peer networks, you have created those massive mafia-like websites hosted outside of the EU that are distributing in a centralized manner streaming or direct download and make a profit out of it. So you will step further, request the filtering, the blocking of this website, and inevitably, as Joe pointed out, it will fail. So you will go one step further and require filtering to be automated and con constantly updated or deep packet inspection technology be deployed and things like this. And this escalation to me is something extremely problematic as the, the measures are, it's not self-regulation, it is imposed. It is imposed through political process. It is imposed through ACTA. It may be imposed through the revision of the, the IPRED directive. So it is not just spontaneous, it is indeed imposed. But the measures we are taking, the so-called, the, the harmless sounding cooperation we see everywhere in ACTA, OECD, G8, IPR um, uh, guidelines of Mr. Barnier and so on, and those measures are programmable machines. Programmable machines that we will program to do enforcement. We will program machines 
to detect, detect whether some behavior or some content is alleged legal or not and will program machines to, to block it or block access to it, automatically remove it. Well, this kind of measures is exactly what we, well, most of us agree should be combated when operators do it for commercial purposes, breaking net neutrality, because it harms business, competition and free speech, and it harms the next startup that you will buy out to pretend that you invent business models and that your previous business models are not flawed. So these are exactly the same measures that operators use to combat competitions, and these are also exactly the same measures that are taken in authoritarian regime to censor the internet for uh, political purposes. So. I'm very much worried here, and I hope that the EU uh, um, legislator will mostly frame this kind of behaviors rather than encourage them through the so-called easy wording of self-regulation. <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure I, I quite recognize the, sort of the apocalyptic view of the world that, that you think we're proposing. I mean, we've always been very clear. We, we want to act within the law. We're not trying to do something outside of the law. We, what we are trying to put in place are reasonable frameworks. We're, we're not trying to infringe people's fundamental human rights. Um, we are simply trying to protect creativity in, in, in Europe by reasonable means. I, I, I just don't recognize the, the future vision of the world that, that you know, I think you're proposing. You should read ACTA in more details then. Yeah, do you both want to come in? Okay, yeah, Joe first. Uh, Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah, I think ACTA is, is worth uh, considering because it's quite a good case study. There's a, a lot of meaning in a small amount of text because it talks about enforcement, similar, uh, civil and criminal enforcement by private companies and there's some of the oddest language I've ever seen. It says, uh, with due respect for the fundamental principle of due process. Um, there is no fundamental principle of due process in international, uh, sorry, fair process uh, in international law. So ACTA creates something that sounds nice, fair process, to replace the words due process. And I'm really happy to hear Mr. Antcliffe saying that he wants to respect the uh, fundamental rights of, uh, of consumers. Because if we don't want, in the OECD and uh, in ACTA, uh, references to fair process, where it should say due process, if you also uh, support replacing all references in such international texts uh, to refer to, uh, to due process, then we can go to our governments and say, if B and Edry agree completely, due process down the line. And that would be fantastic. Um, I completely agree that it is a question of proportionality. Um, what we mustn't do in regulating things is to turn copyright into a concept that is in itself vilified, <laughs> because then we shoot ourselves in the foot. Having said that, what would seem to be very innocent in itself, the concept of peer-to-peer -peer sharing and friends passing things around, becomes a drip effect which cumulatively eventually has a very significant economic impact upon IP rights holders. And so the very fact that it's an individual to an individual around the world doesn't really make the difference when it comes down to the, the, to the impact that it has upon, upon the cumulative effect of sales. I'm going to actually um, say a little bit about that because it's very tempting to now start talk about um, copyright and whether or not um, piracy may um, um, decrease or increase economic benefits or creativity for that matter. Uh, but what I want to try is to go back to some of these fundamental principles because a lot of people have mentioned fundamental rights. Uh, and I learned something new because I didn't know that the right to pursue business or do business was a fundamental right. 
Um, but it also strikes me that then others are free to do so and then we get competition and it's something that in general as a liberal I like uh, very much and I don't believe in over-regulation um, at all. But I do recognize that the fundamental right to life, for example, is a different one than the fundamental right to do business as a conceptual matter. I'm not trying to say any one of you is trying to uh, infringe on the right to life, but just to acknowledge that there is a hierarchy of rights. And it's not only me who thinks this, but it seems that this recent European Court of Justice ruling has actually quite clearly uh, established that whether or not people have uh, have copyrights which are a right in and of themselves, that the ways in which those are sought to be enforced have limits. And I think that that is where the discussion here uh, sometimes gets blurred a little bit or where the arguments get blurred that even when um, there, uh, there can be uh, a right on the one hand or um, an objective on the one hand, uh, that the means in which to accomplish those can have collateral damage and can pose a challenge to other rights, I guess. Um, so I would be interested to see what you all think of this ruling of the European Court of Justice, uh, because a lot of people have actually s considered it as quite a game changer for this whole discussion. Uh, and perhaps it can also give some closure about what rights prevail and uh, what methods are appropriate and are inappropriate. Um, in Europe, so maybe that would be um, that would be something um, to discuss. And then I'm going to also, in the meantime, look around for questions. So I don't know if any of the panel wants to respond to this, Malcolm. Yes, I'll say a little about the um, the right to do business um, that is protected. Not obviously, it's not um, protected by the um, ECHR, as far as I'm aware, but by the Charter of Fundamental Rights and Freedoms. It's my understanding. I'm not a lawyer on this, I must say, but. Uh, I think if you think about it, it's um, it's not so surprising. If you think about what it, what the right that is actually being protected there, because they were the court was balancing legitimate interests on two sides in in the Sabam Scarlet Alexander case. Um, there was the property right in copyright, the or some people what's called legally a uh, property right in copyright, on the one hand. And there was um, the business of the network provider that was it being asked to expend large amounts of money in complicated and um, uncertain systems on a permanent basis for the benefit of some other party. And it, I don't think it is that surprising that fundamental rights should protect my right not to have to subsidize his business just because he wants me to. Um, now, it, we can be sympathetic to the harm that is done by um, intellectual property right infringement <laughs> to the recorded entertainment industries. Um, and I'm, I'm not going to get on board with those that say, oh, well, there's no, there's no harm there making a fine profit. I, I recognize that infringement um, does cost you some money. But we have rights too. We are rights holders. We are all rights holders. We all have the right to engage in trade, that's one of the founding principles of the European Union. But to engage in communication, to receive and impart information, and to do the things that allow us to do that, which includes running networks to support systems that, um, that do that, and not to have, and in a sense, the, the right that was being protected there was both a particular commercial expression of the right of freedom of expression to be able to, um, to engage ourselves, and also, at the same time, a sort of um, particular commercial expression of the right to property, that our property shouldn't be taken and used for his purposes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and so there is that balance to be struck. And it, there is a question of proportionality in this. And there is a balancing of interests that the courts ought to strike. Um, but they did feel that there does come a point where you're just saying, well, just because you're the internet intermediary doesn't mean that you are just a tool of somebody else's commercial interests and that fundamental rights will protect against that and will enforce that, no, there comes a point where you have to say, no, that's not fair anymore. Mal I think, I think Mal I mean, Malcolm is right. It was a question about proportionality. But the case did still underline um, the essentials of Article 83 of the Copyright Directive, which is that intermediaries do have an obligation um, in the member states to ensure that rights holders are in a position to apply for injunctions. That, that was upheld. Nothing, nothing has changed on that. It simply said that the measures in that particular case um, that, uh, that the court at the lower instance in Belgium 
applied um, were too wide. Um, but the fundamental obligation is still there. But just a follow-up question of what Malcolm said also in this context, do you think the point of disproportionality has been reached now, that there is too much push for internet service providers to pick up the tab? Clearly found in that case that it had, and we are clearly going to have a discussion going forward about the extent to which this was just a narrow case and couldn't possibly be read any broader than in that one very specific set of circumstances, or on the other hand, um, what's actually quite a wide-ranging ruling that's written in really quite general and overarching terms that sets out standards by which we can judge not only this one particular case, but also future measures that are adopted. So um, they didn't just say, in this particular case, you've gone too far, but it actually set out a standard that could be applied of a, um, and the wording was, I think, um, um, a complicated, costly, and permanent computer system at its own expense was, I think, the operative wording. Now, that is a standard that it said would result in serious infringement of the fundamental right to do business. And that sets out a, a, a new legal standard. And we will have, look, the lawyers will go to town on this for a, a, a long time, I'm sure. But I wouldn't um, say that this case is one which is just unique to its own particular circumstances. There were basic principles being considered by the European Court for the first time. And it chose to set out a judgment in what are qu quite broad terms, clearly to identify that there are serious interests on the other side, it's not all about Article 8 through the Copyright Directive, it's, it's about other things too. Yeah, and I think that the, there, the cost aspect is one, but the process aspect is another one, not just due process, but also time process. Because recently I asked um, a small, well, small country telco, uh, how many requests from the content industry they got for blocking or taking down um, sites. I don't know if anyone's interested in taking a wild guess, but it sort of blew my mind, since we're doing polls today anyway. Does anyone want to guess? Small country, the telco, how many requests from only content side to take down sites? 20,000 a week. And so dealing with those requests uh, or shifting sifting through them already takes time. So I also think that whether or not we want to call it regulation, uh, whether we want to talk uh, about what the government should do and what uh, business communities should do, that we should look at processes that are manageable uh, and that there is not an incentive by some to obstruct the tubes or the system to an extent that that would be a benefit in and of itself uh, or that it would <coughs> stagnate the business of others. So that was just a side note. And I'm also interested uh, in general about the costs of enforcement, uh, what if it leans in the public sphere and is in the hands of government and what uh, is taken up by, by private businesses? Because I've also heard examples, for example, from France about the costs of Hadopi enforcement and also the benefits that it brought. And it seems to be quite disproportionate, but um, I don't know, perhaps others have some thoughts. I'm just going to look around the room, see if there's any more questions or whether we should conclude. Maybe I'm not seeing it. OK, sorry, yeah, you're behind the camera a little bit. Go ahead. Uh, just one question. Uh, among the envisaged actions uh, described by the music industry representative uh, was uh, contacting payment service providers and ad uh, operators in order to block uh, the financing or the service providing two sites, uh, two illegal sites. Uh, since I didn't hear any mention to the word court, are we talking about sites which the music industry considers illegal or sites that have been deemed illegal by a court? Because in the latter, in, in the first case, I think if that's not operating outside the law, I don't know what is. I mean, just blocking the financing of a site which you and you alone consider illegal. Just a clarification. Um, in, the, in the examples that we gave to those uh, to the credit card companies, there were there were two sites, both operating out of Russia. All of it, all of those sites had on them was our music, nothing else. They didn't do anything else. Those websites, they simply made our music available. The, there is I mean, there, there is just no justification for making our music available without any license from us whatsoever. We know we didn't give it a license. We know all our music was available on there. We didn't think it was unreasonable to say to the credit card companies, 
this site is illegal. We'd like you not to take payments from it. And did they? Um, in the case of the UK credit card companies, yes, they stopped processing payments from those sites. I'd like to also say something about this, that it is very easy and, and big record companies and large businesses are, are an easy target. But behind them also, the content is delivered on the whole by small individuals. The average composer, I think in the UK, earns under £5,000 a year. We're not actually talking about just major pop stars and huge corporations. We're talking about hundreds and thousands of people who struggle very hard to make a quite small living. And those people are indeed all materially disadvantaged by a climate which allows people to take their content for free and feel that it's okay to do so. Well, just a small response to that because I care deeply about uh, arts and creation. I think it's a pillar of open society, but I, I truly question, and that's something for a different discussion, which we'll surely have, uh, what are the best ways to, to really make sure that uh, artists get a fair yeah. remuneration? And I believe it's debatable w whether enforcement will, will cause that or whether we need more drastic reforms uh, of copyright laws in general. But that's really for a different discussion, but I just felt like I want to emphasize how important I think uh, it is that people who create get a fair remuneration. But I think sometimes the discussion is so distorted um, that even if there would be many, many more measures to battle this climate, that we're looking in a tunnel instead of zooming out and looking at the bigger picture. But now Joe wants to come in. Thank you. Um, the the um, poor artist uh, argument is um, compelling. But I think we... Oops. <laughs> Glad very, you agree. Very good. <laughs> um, we have to stop giving, educating uh, the world that copyright is, as Commissioner Cruz said, and, and uh, you said you feared, copyright is a ridiculous thing. Mm. Um, our, the exceptions and limitations regime in Europe is completely unworkable, yet the content industry uh, stops progress. What does, what does the exceptions and limitations regime mean for European citizens? It means that when esteemed academic uh, Richard Stallman uploaded a video onto YouTube with um, a clip of music, which was completely fair use and not in a, a, a separate exploitation of the work, when he put that on YouTube, it was uh, left online by YouTube in the United States. In Europe, the owner of the work complained to um, complete to YouTube saying, well, the exceptions and limitations regime here is confused, unclear, it's probably illegal in most European countries. So Google just blocked access to that um, entirely legal, unexploitative video for everybody in Europe. That makes people think copyright is an ass. Um, licensing from one country to the next is uh, extremely difficult in Europe. Uh, I, the amount of money that Spotify's lawyers must make uh, defies belief because we've got a ridiculous uh, system that's preventing legitimate content getting to, legi to consumers. It makes the legal system look like an ass and this legal system is being defended by the copyright industry. Term extension, the greatest donkey of them all, yes, if there are starving artists, why on earth are we sp did we spend years getting term extension in place in order to benefit the richest artists in Europe and more particularly in the United States and feed the coffers of the, the starving um, Warner Group and friends? Sorry, that's an SME, um, I forgot. Anyone else? Because oh yes, go ahead. I'm Lena Rompainen from Electronic Frontier Finland, and I just wanted wanted to bring out the point that a lot of people, at least in my age group, we also copied tapes when I when we were young, and then when we grew older and started making more money, we started buying more content, and I fear that if 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 the content industry keeps on sticking with their sticks 
and and uh, making uh, making itself look like a very bad guy in all these messes, you you're not going to lose only only the current generation. You will keep the rest, the future generations also away from becoming legal buyers. I mean, I was I was very open with you at the beginning. We don't think it is just about sticks. We know it's about carrots. We know we have to create services that people want um, to use um, and and also to pay for. Um, there are 250 of them in Europe alone. Um, you can obtain all of the world's music for a tiny amount of money a month. In fact, on some of the services, because they're ad-funded, you as the consumer don't have to pay anything at all. So I think it's unfair to say that we just stuck our head in the sand and, and completely ignored the consumer and we just reverted to the sticks. I don't think we have at all. Um, I think we've, we probably license our content more than any other, any other business that I can think of. And I can't think of many businesses that have moved to over a third of its revenues in, in under 10 years um, coming from online, from having been completely physical. Just to add that in the Netherlands, some um, creators and consumer organizations did feel that there was a tendency to criminalize audiences, uh, no fingers pointed, but there was a tendency uh, for that, and that was proactively um, refuted, or people just didn't think that, that was useful and then started to come up with their own sort of bottom-up. Um, proposal. So I think the concept of who is criminalizing, who who, who is policing, who uh, remains very relevant, and where the incentives are for both change or for uh, regulation or for um, pushing to regulation. Fascinating. But Malcolm, you want to come in? I just wanted to say very briefly, because I think there's a danger of a rat hole here about the rights and wrongs and the merits and demerits of the recorded entertainment industries and how important they are and how much they're being harmed and so forth. That it's best, that it's most helpful to avoid because there's a bigger issue here. I mean, we, we, we've all got sympathies with the situation, or at least I've got sympathies with the situation that they face, and we also have frustrations. Many of my members would like to do more business in um, promoting digital content legally and find it very difficult to deal with some of the things that were just complained about. Um, so I understand that, but there is a broad, bigger issue here. I started, I opened my remarks by listing a great number of people that are interested in policing unlawful and illegal content and behavior online that goes well beyond the narrow interests of um, the recorded entertainment industries and goes well beyond questions about whether or not they're a sympathetic um, complainant. You know, we can't, you know, terrorism, child protection, racism and xenophobia, these um, medicines that are being sold that will kill people. You know, these things matter, but do we really want to ask intermediaries to decide whether or not a particular thing that is complained of falls into that category, when we, having accepted that that category absolutely must be defended and must be um, action must be taken against it when it is true? Yeah? Or do we want to build a society where we have one rule offline based around um, standard and, and long-established procedures and respect for basic rights and basic procedures and independent judgments? And online, a society where actually because you've got an intermediary, you don't need any of that. I believe that the law should apply online as it should offline. I believe that the rule of law should apply online as it should offline. And then when any of these list of people, including the rights holders, but not exclusively, including people that are actually maybe much more sympathetic to some of you that are critics of the recorded entertainment industries, when any of you, these people come to um, internet intermediaries, there are times when we do have to say, even without a court process, it's so urgent and the interest at stake is so severe that we must take action first. But we should start to define when those circumstances are and narrow them down very carefully, because otherwise we will find that the rule of law does not apply online, because we are just simply taking orders from anyone that claims harm is done. And that is a very dangerous place for a society to be put. And my members, as the intermediaries, don't really want to be facilitating that. I think that's very well said and very true. Uh, let me look around for a last round, or otherwise I'm going to thank you all for being here, especially the panelists, uh, for engaging in what's not always an easy discussion. It was probably not the last time that we have to have this discussion, so I also want to welcome everyone to continue sending suggestions and engaging with each other, finding each other to try to find solutions instead of uh, addressing the problem. So, um, thanks.